So my name is Daniel and I am an optomechanical prototyper. I'm a fast prototyper. I run a workshop out here in Northridge, California that's all about fast prototyping of tech products. Anything that has a light, a sensor, and involves human vision is kind of my domain. And my whole thing is going really fast and getting through those early mistakes as, as fast as we can. I spend a lot of time in front of the CAD workstation. Sometimes I'll design for a whole week and then build for a whole week. And there came a point after several years of doing this in a dark windowless building where I realized I could do those things anywhere. And I started looking for options, right? How can I get out of the shop and go be somewhere else? And the answer I came up with was the GFC. When I looked at the GFC, I knew right away that it was kind of my people. The way that it was constructed, even using the same software to do things, Fusion 360, uh, that all spoke to me. But I wasn't sure about it until I actually saw one in person. And uh, GFC brought them down to Santa Monica and I actually got to sit in one and I felt like I was in a tree house on top of a truck in a parking lot. And that tree house feeling spoke to me so much, right? Going from a dark cave where I do my CAD work to going to like a tree house by the ocean, I was sold. I had decided that the, the GFC was gonna be something I was interested in, but then the question was, what am I gonna put it on? And I have this old 1994 two-wheel drive Toyota pickup, which is kind of an unusual platform for overlanding, right? It's, <laughs> it's not really the normal choice for overlanding. And the thing is, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with this truck. I had a project almost 10 years ago in Nicaragua where we were working in areas of the country where there's no power, uh, no electrical power. And so we were driving out with our hosts into the mountains in Toyota Hilux pickups. And I had never seen one or ridden in one until then, and I fell in love. You know, driving up a high-grade mountaintop in a rough place was just uh, transformative. So I came back to LA and immediately started searching for one, and I, I found this one. What was the story in finding it? Like, did you settle it all? <laughs> like... <laughs> I saw so many absolute beater Toyota pickups. I mean, the first one I got into couldn't shift. Like, the shift knuckle was gone on top of the transmission. And uh, this one really spoke to me. There was a, a two brothers who had purchased it from the first owner and they lifted it and did a bunch of mods to the whole thing and then decided that they wanted a four by four. And so they sold it real cheap. I bought this for 3000 bucks in 2010 with 130,000 miles on it. And I got it and found out what they had done to it, <laughs> which was terrible. The entire dash was held on by wood screws. There were sockets pounded into the freeze plugs in the engine. I mean, it was really a nightmare. So I went through the whole truck, you know, top to bottom and uh, and brought it back to life. Nice. How long did that take? Like your little affair with it has been how long so far? Since 2010. 2010. And uh, actually I had basically just been driving it into the ground. And when I got the GFC, I realized it was time to kind of put some more love back into the truck, right? So I replaced all of the um, tail light and backup lights with LEDs. The headlights are now LED headlights. I built airbag suspension for it. So because I run a prototype shop, even though the original airbags aren't available anymore, the, they were Ride Right 1130s from Firestone, I ended up basically just copying the kit idea from documentation. So those are the original um, Firestone airbags that you would have gotten for a Toyota truck like this when the kits were available. And then I rebuilt them here on the water jet in Fusion 360 and just cranked them out in a weekend, which was a blast, right? Why do you why do you make not buy? In this case, it's because they didn't sell. <laughs> In this anymore. case, because I couldn't get it anymore, right? So if I can buy, it's sort of the prototyping mentality. If you can buy it, don't rebuild it, right? So anytime I can spend money and solve a problem, I do. But there are a lot of things like those ride rights that are simply unavailable anymore. I spent several days trying to buy them, and I spent one or two days building them. What else have you made on this thing that you? might have bought the components for, but the systems you've created yourself. This is uh, just a shelf for bedding. And as, as simple as it is, you know, I'm taking advantage of the, uh, the bolt-on bosses that you have in the bed here and some extrusion I had laying around and, and built this shelf system. So when I'm up in the bed, I can reach down and pull everything out and go up to the top. And actually, I started out in the GFC forums buying this um, cargo net which didn't really work for me in the way that this shell is structured and everything, it just kind of draped down and didn't fit very well. So stretching it over a hard frame made it easy to pull out bedding and go to sleep, which I'm, I'm thrilled with, right? It's really simple. It's definitely still a prototype and it works well enough. When I first saw the well nuts, I, I understood kind of why they are the way they are, right? Like well, I don't want to put a huge load into a point on the frame. Um, for this application where I'm just basically stuffing bedding in, the loads on the well nuts are small, right? And I've got it distributed across four well nuts. You know, overall this was like an okay, flexible solution. So I run it this way so I can use it as an office sitting over here. 
So like if I'm pulled up alongside the ocean or whatever, I can set up my laptop on the hard one and then sit down here on a stool that I bring with me. And also it's set up like this so that at night I can pop up the middle section of the floor and just pull all these things out. Or when I am uh, packing up in the morning, I can pop that one out and just stuff it all there. It's, it's absolutely just a convenience thing basically with this edge. It's just all 80-20, it looks like. Yeah, it's the, it's even the, the um, import 80-20, right? So this is 20-20 extrusion, 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters, and then all just water jet cut brackets for it. So I have a water jet here at the shop, so I have a lot of luxury in making uh, small aluminum parts. That's how I ended up installing these. Um, you know, I haven't ever owned a modern truck. And so when I saw what Toyota had done with the bed rails and how other owners were using these bed rails, I was like, well, that looks great. And I knew about L-Track from aerospace stuff, but the, the concept of having a rail all the way around the bed to strap things down made total sense to me. So I made um, these washer backers that run behind the bed rail, they're water jet cut aluminum bits. And then my GFC system, if you want to call it that, is something really simple. I have three bags. This is like on top, it's uh, toothbrush, deodorant, soap, bathroom stuff, slippers, and then a towel and a change of clothes. And that just clips into the L-Track. And I don't have to worry about straps or molly or anything like that, right? It just goes there. And then I have, on the opposite side, I have a, a coffee kit. So I have an AeroPress and a, a grinder and a jet boil. I don't know how many people have seen the little, I just like shot beans all over the place. This is a little hand grinder that you can get for about a hundred bucks to do espresso grinds. And then um, here I have the vice bag, which I love. And my vices are pretty minimal. I have uh, like popcorn <laughs> and uh, a Bluetooth speaker for when I want some music. And that's essentially most of what I take with me. So when I got the GFC, my vision was to get out of my black box cave of CAD design and go out in the world and do, do my work out in the world, you know, enjoy the beach. It's not a unique vision, right? Lots of people figured out you could work remote, but that was my vision. And what I found is when I got the GFC and went out in the world, I didn't do any work. I just enjoyed the environment and what really uh, became an obsession was cooking outside. And I feel like everything tastes better when you're camping. And so for me, cooking just became that much more pleasurable. And I bought the little Dometic fridge, which I run off of a Goal Zero battery box because I didn't want to engineer a whole solar system. And um, I've got, you know, normally in here, I, I always keep uh, some fresh eggs, some butter, uh, sourdough bread, and a handful of other food items, salt and pepper, the kind of the basics. And I'll go out by the ocean and cook myself breakfast once a week. It's simple, but I like to make like an open-faced egg sandwich with some green onions on top. You know, sometimes the onions have like a, are made with some really delicious vinegar, bacon, and some torched tomatoes, like cherry tomatoes. That's an absolute favorite. The, but yeah, that, that's become like a regular pleasure in my life where I leave at least once a week and go hang out and make breakfast outdoors if I don't do a full camp. What's over there in the left corner over there? Yeah, this is kind of like, um, if I go over there, that's kind of like a utility corner. So. There's a few different things going on. Um, this is actually a tarp, and this came from like Hollywood set lighting that goes over the entire bed and, and actually conceals the entire thing. So it sticks on this Velcro and covers from front to back and over the back door. And it, it just happened to be magically exactly the right size to do that. So how does that work? I see, I now, I'm now seeing the Velcro. Right. So this again was kind of prototypey. Um, but yeah, I, I found this in some leftover stuff from set. Let's see, should have it set up better for the video, but it, it sticks like this, like this, and all the way across the back, and conceals everything in the bed. So this is what it looks like when you've covered the entire bed, and then there just so happens to be enough left over that you can cover the back window too and prevent any line of sight into the truck. So here in Los Angeles, this is like a total win as far as concealing all your stuff. And I do, I love to keep everything in my GFC at all times, so I do worry about security of everything, and this 
you know, out of sight is out of mind. So it might seem a little bit weird to buy a, and use a wedge camper in a mega city like Los Angeles. But for me, it turned out to be like a really cool thing to do because this camper and even just the topper part of the camper is something that gives me a private space anywhere. It like makes a private space out of all these public spaces. And having the GFC, the first thing I did was went out and showed all my friends. What I found like really powerful about this thing is that I could go out and meet my friends where they were and meet in the GFC. So my friend Eric and I sat down and had our first beer together in three years, just in the back in the summer night near his house and it was beautiful. And I took my friend Dana out to the beach in Malibu and we sat in this thing with the cabana panel up and the ocean framed by this trapezoid here and it was just beautiful. And we spent hours connecting, sitting in the truck. And that's an experience that I've repeated over and over again. The most private spaces in a big city are pay to play. And this GFC is not. This is my space where I can do whatever I want. And I really love that about it. Another thing for me is it's an ongoing project. I run a prototyping company and I think about prototyping all the time. And if you look at how I approach the GFC, which in, in a way as a V2 is its own prototype, everything in here is prototypical. For example, the lighting system. Um, I installed LEDs all the way around, LED strips and everything else. My whole goal was I want to be able to find the lights in the dark easily. And so I put the switch from a guitar pedal right here with a little 3D printed box and then a dimmer to dim them up and down. And one of the dangers in prototyping and one of the cool things about prototyping is if you make a prototype just good enough, it will stay forever. Like never <laughs> underestimate the staying power of a good enough solution, right? So I never bothered to remove the electrical tape from this thing. Once my lights worked and I was enjoying them, I just left them there and moved on to the next thing. And there's been a lot of those things. Um, we talked about the tarp. This is another kind of prototypical thing, right? It's adhesive Velcro and I can hide everything that's in the back of the GFC. Um, I put in the shelving system, which is all 80-20, uh, just 20 millimeter extrusion and water jet cut parts. And it was good enough. And I left it there. The tailgate that I cook and cut my food on is just a piece of marine grade plywood just bolted to the tailgate itself with some rib nuts. And again, I had all kinds of ideas about this folding out into a big L table for cooking and all kinds of exotic things, but bolting a piece of plywood here was good enough and allowed me to move on to the next thing. And so as a prototyper, it's not only kind of a continuous project where I get to try out all kinds of new ideas, it's also a reflection of how I approach these problems. So you've seen that I have a whole um, goal zero power system and everything, but when I, this is another example of the way prototypes kind of become permanent. Uh, I installed all this lighting before I had solar and before I had any kind of battery in the back of the truck. I knew I didn't want to run a wire to the main power system. So in powering the rear lights, I just use rechargeable uh, Milwaukee drill batteries. I have a lot of these and you can get adapter clips. So the entire LED lighting system runs off of these batteries. I can always connect this to the goal zero later, but it's a simple and prototypical way to get started. And most people who have a GFC are gonna have a power drill. So. Let's take a look at that wiring. How do you have it all set up? <laughs> so again, uh, this is the prototypical style. I knew I wanted an inline fuse, given the amount of amperage that can, these batteries can kick out. And then I use these uh, wire nuts from Germany. They're called Wago nuts. And they're, uh, they're a lever nut that can lock in a wire very quickly and you can snap it back in place and now you have an electrical connection. So these are reusable, they're strong, and they're safe. So they're perfect for prototyping electrical systems like this. What's that uh, adapter that you have? Is it a particular brand? This adapter is, I mean, it's one of these Amazon brands. It's an N unpronounceable NC year. There are a variety of these on Amazon. I like this one particularly because of the way that it mounts. But yeah, I think there are seven or eight competing adapters. What's this guy? <laughs> now that's just laziness. Yeah, let's be real. The old that's, twist and tape. That's just being lazy. I knew I wanted this to be able to uh, plug and unplug. Like I wanted to be able to unplug the LEDs and I wanted to be able to unplug the batteries. So there are barrel jacks going into the lighting controller. We could talk about small truck problems. Yeah. So one of the one of the major issues I had when I got my GFC is essentially a small truck problem. I might be one of a few people who have this problem. The 
the cabana panels were essentially at 90 degrees, which put them directly at eye level. And I had a couple of moments that night where I'd like almost hit my eyeball on the panel. So being in a prototyping shop, I reached out to support and work with them on uh, designing a higher, designing new brackets that lift the panel up a few more degrees so that it clears my, my head. And this was both a big safety improvement and also just more comfortable that I can walk up to the camper and use it without fear of hitting my head on the cabana panels. I think of these as small truck problems, <laughs> similarly to my airbags and the other aspects of the build where I'm dealing with like low weight capacity, small engine, and uh, you know, in here, just low overall height. The truck has got a two inch body lift and it's on slightly bigger tires. I couldn't name the numbers of these tires, but even then, um, yeah, it wasn't enough to get the panels up high enough. Where do you like to camp the most? Oh man, I had an incredible experience out at a place called Mount Pinos. And Mount Pinos is like a, a mountain range, you know, somewhere north of here, about an hour and 20 minutes. And not only can you climb that entire mountain with a little two wheel drive truck, but there are incredible views and also this unbelievable wind where I could drive out onto this um, mountain overlook and this is, uh, it's weird to say this on video where I could drive out onto this mountain overlook and these unbelievable winds would, would come up and envelop me in the truck. And it just felt like the, the grandiosity of the view and these elemental winds, it, it, it was an experience I could get nowhere else. And I actually, I went there with the GFC and pulled out on this uh, overlook and sat down and the winds came up and kind of met me. I ended up having a picnic there. I tried to leave, I couldn't leave. I came back, I sat down again, and just, I ended up staying there like four or five hours on that overlook, just enjoying the view, and I could do nothing else. And it was one of the more beautiful days I've ever had. I've gone back three times. One of the things that I learned from the GFC was that it's, it's best to go out and try things with it and then see like what you want. So um, a simple example is like the first time I went out, I realized that I didn't have a tailgate lock. And so I ended up um, finding a tailgate, a locking tailgate latch from a, uh, Toyota Hilux and putting it on there and it's like close enough, right? In terms of experiences that I enjoyed, like I love the idea of sitting on the tailgate and having uh, a little, like a comfortable place to hang out. And so that became the plywood, the lighting, especially lighting being dimmable. And it also um, kind of dictated how I set up the back. So I like things to be very, very open, almost nothing in here because I want to be able to easily climb in and out or go inside and, and hang. And so that means no big build outs in here. So it's also a work truck, you're saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I use my truck for truck stuff. I've had this truck since 2010 and it's hauled the entire contents of my shop several times. It's been my home several times. And I keep it in such a way that I can pull out the fridge. For example, the other day I hauled a whole bunch of steel in the back and I, I'm constantly hauling materials, groceries and doing real truck stuff. If the GFC prevented me from doing truck stuff, I wouldn't own it. What's beautiful about it is it does let me do truck stuff. Another place where you can see how prototypical this truck is, is in the solar power system. So I use just a, a goal zero battery. Then I have a, a switch just laying back here and that powers the fridge and everything else, charges the phones, does all the work in the back. But when I hooked that solar up, I taped solar panels to the roof and I was on my way to camp by the beach in Oceanside. So I quickly printed these wire holder brackets and I even printed the T-nuts that went into the extrusion and just bolted it all on and it was good enough and so it stayed in this like dark brown state ever since. I've got two um, sun power flexible panels on the roof. Actually I would highly, I should say hi to For solar, um, I wanted to do something a little different and so I bought these sun power solar panels that have a higher efficiency rating. They're flat flexible panels and I wanted to stick them directly to the roof, 300 watts, figuring I was going to be in here doing CAD, running a laptop and a fridge and everything else all day. Um, I actually wouldn't recommend flat flexible panels to anyone. Uh, my first flat flexible panel burned out uh, within a week of installation and the other two have been fine since then. The big problem with the flat flexible solar panels is that when you touch them to the roof, they conduct a ton of heat into the roof. And so in the tent, you're 10 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter at that surface than you would be otherwise. Wow. Yeah, it's brutal. And uh, 
you need about a one inch air gap to make it work. And I tried, so I did a whole line of experimentation on this and actually tested it out. And yeah, at one inch, they stop heating the roof. If I could do it again, I would go hard panels all the way and keep them up on beef bars or some other roof rack. You ran the temperature experiment, and you also had the CFD experiment. I'm wondering, is yep. there any other experiments you've run? The color experiment. Oh, the color experiment. Yeah, I don't know if we want to talk about that. Um, yeah, it's funny. So yeah, there have been three three experiments, right? There was the, the solar experiment, like can I use the flat flexible panels on the roof? And I experimented with how much of a gap do I need to, uh, to how far do I need to space them from the roof until they stop heating the roof? And the answer is 20 millimeters or about an inch. And I did a second set of experiments uh, which was around the aerodynamics of the GFC. In particular, when I first drove it home, the rear suspension was overloaded and the, the truck was, uh, it felt like it was buffeted by wind. So I wanted to understand like, what are the aerodynamics of the GFC and where are the high pressure and low pressure zones and boundary layers. And then lately, what's got me really obsessed, I chose the stone gray tent. And the stone gray tent inside on a sunny day, has a very yellow cast. Like the fabric in Transmission of Light is kind of a purple yellow, which may sound like a contradiction in terms. It's a brown yellow. And then the roof panel is actually quite yellow in terms of color. And combined with the green Transforma floor, I feel like it's just a strange color environment. Like it's not really what I uh, would choose for myself. And so I've been experimenting with some of my optical equipment on how to change the overall color cast inside the camper. It's just more to my liking. And one of the first changes I hope I'll get later today is to change the color of the cushions with just with a different fabric. So the roof is yellow in transmission, which means that it's cutting blue. And if it's cutting the blue, adding more blue back into the interior should bring it back toward neutral. And so I've actually uh, made, with my mom, made a set of fitted sheets. <laughs> that's a blue that seemed to do that really well. And uh, yeah, I hope I can uh, find my ideal color environment or lighting environment inside of this thing. For Daniel? Yeah. All right. Oh man, present from mom. Unboxing on video. So my mom made these fitted sheets as part of my color correction project for the camper. So I think it's too yellow in there. So we made some blue sheets and this is the unboxing. These are all the way from North Dakota. Cannot wait to try these out. There's a note from mom. Daniel, I hope this set is just what you wished for. I love you, mom. Love you too, mom. And uh, let's check them out. I mean, they look great. I always complain that in Los Angeles, you can't get the same kind of meats that you can get in North Dakota. And there's a meat market there that makes incredible jerky called 3BE. And that's, <laughs> those are just some koozies from 3BE to remind me of the incredible. Dude, Wallace. We like video and called and then I looked at the measurements and we actually went shopping for fabric together last time I was home, so. <laughs> oh man, I already like it better. Do you see that? So they are a lot more blue than the original uh, green Cordura. So the idea was that, so because the lighting environment is very yellow, which means that the blue has been cut, bringing in more blue into the environment will make it more color neutral in here. And I dare say it worked. I have a whole box. We bought swatches of like 12 different fabrics and then I laid them all out inside and checked them out. It was actually very surprising what worked and what didn't. Um, had some with patterns, some that were more cold blue versus this green blue. Uh, also a bright orange and yeah, I laid them all out inside and looked at them with my eyes and then photographed them And this one was a clear winner. It was like very obviously the best one that neutralized the yellow as much as possible But also looked like great on skin and just looked great in general When I found out that this camper would be available for my 30 year old truck, I was already pretty impressed like that was some, like a big moment for me and there was a moment when 
I was talking about this. There's a there's a guy who runs a prototyping shop just like mine. He's in Europe, and he's a he's a great guy. And we were talking about we make all these things for people that maybe we don't even like stuff that we don't even think should be in the world. But it's just a part of our business to make things. And we were talking about categories of things that can actually help people or improve the quality of their lives. And this is one of them that came up where without this, I definitely wouldn't have been out camping 12 times this year. And I definitely wouldn't have been close to nature. I would have been in this box with the lights off, with no windows in front of a CAD workstation. And I think that's kind of the tremendous power of something like this.